I greet you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. Almighty God, we give thanks that in the darkness you are the light, in the chaos you are the structure, in the emptiness you are the only thing, the only one to fill us. So we pray today that you would turn our attention to you, that you would draw us together, that you would truly make us your temple, the place that your spirit could live and dwell and express who you are. Do it today in us, we pray. And God's people said, Amen. We light the Christ candle today. I invite Sam to do that for us. As we are reminded, in the midst of the darkness, the light shines. In the midst of the chaos, God comes and brings order. Do you have a reason or two or 10,000 to give thanks to Him today? Um, I invite you to put your, your phones down and your worries aside and just focus on who God is today. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Sing that again. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Let's worship today together. The sun comes up, it's a new
God is, sing it. You're rich in love and you're slow. away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other found I know nothing but the blood of the blood of Jesus for my cleansing this my plea nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the foe. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. This 
is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as us, our need for him, and um, as you join, as Yvonne leads us in reading, this is Psalm 139, it'll be come up on the screen, and the psalmist is talking about that very thing, God searching and knowing us. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and, and when, when I, I rise. rise. You, you perceive, perceive my, my thoughts from, from far away. away. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Where, Where can, can I go, go from, from your spirit? spirit? Where, Where can, can I flee from, from your, your presence? presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If, if I, I make, make my, my bed, bed in the, in the depths, depths, you, you are, are there. there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even, even there, there your, your hand, hand will guide me. me. Your right hand will hold me fast. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. We just were singing this from Psalm 139. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. Slay 
hit the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. I'm no longer So I could walk right through it My fears were drowned in perfect love You rescued me so I could stand and sing I am a child Do you see the sea before you? You split the sea so I could walk right through Stand and sing I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave child of God. Who are you? I am a child of God. Almighty God, we come before you this morning with so many places fear would dominate our life. For some of us, it's physical. It's within our very body. For some of us, it's social. It's, it's relational. It's, it's between us and someone else. For some of us, it may be cultural. Uh, it may be national. It may be on some other level. There are fears we have about, about finances or about government or about the future or what if somebody finds out about the past. There are so many places that fear motivates us. But this morning we're asking for, first of all, you to show us. Reveal yourself to us. Let us see where fear has been the dominant thing. And then remind us that's not that's not the force that should shape us. It's who we are in you. It's who you have shown yourself to be. You are the God who was and is and is to come. I am who I am. I will be who I will be, and I will show myself to you. And not just to you, but those you love, those you're carrying a burden for today. Will they ever see? Will they ever know? Will they ever get it? Some have seemed so disinterested in you. God, we're we're counting on you to break through. Some have said they've been following you, and yet their lives look nothing like who we understand you are. And yet you're patient. Remind us today who we are. It's all in relation to you, the Creator. It's all in relation to you, our Heavenly Father. It's all in relation to you, the Good Shepherd. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. Of Maybe you sing that as an intercessor for someone else. I'm no longer a slave to fear. May they say this one day. I am a child of God. I am a child. I am a child of God. Amen. Good morning, church. 
Good morning, Pastor Chelsea. I'm working on a new introduction, but I'm like, what do you say? Hey, guys. <laughs> I'm working on it, so just pray for me about that. Um, <laughs> things that rack my brain, right? Um, I have a challenge for you this morning, and it's not just the couple of announcements that we have, but I'll tell you those first. Um, they're right in your bulletin, but... One is that if you've not received your 2020 giving receipt, shoot Dale an email, and that's in the bulletin. It also went out in an email last night to you guys. And then the bulletin says our groups this week will be on Zoom, but they will not. We will be in the building Wednesday this week on Wednesday right. for adult um, Bible study and for youth groups. So we will be in the building. So just be sure. We'll send an email tomorrow, you know, yep. just reminding you that we're back in the building. But the bulletin does say on Zoom, so we just want to make sure that you know that one correction. Um, and there's some information about campus ministry and then an update on the offering we took, uh, for some of the families that I mentioned three or four weeks ago to you guys. So those are all in your bulletin. So you can check those out. And, uh, and the one challenge I have for you this morning is I was, I was walking this week, taking after pastor Jeff doing these daily walks. <laughs> right. And as I was walking, I walked another way. I always go the same route. I don't know if anyone else ever walks or does that. And you just, it's like a creature of habit. Um, and I walked a different way and I had a different perspective of my house mm. than I normally do. Right. And I stood there and for those of you that don't know, my husband and I bought the reason we moved to Sylvania. If you don't know why we don't live in Chelsea anymore, we had an opportunity to buy my grandparents home, which I grew up in. So that was a huge part of my life. So I stood there and I was just remembering all these moments that I had when I was young and I remember running and I couldn't wait for my grandpa to get home. He worked, you know, most of his life, and, and I couldn't, I loved seeing his truck pull in the driveway. I remember looking out the window, and I was just having, like, these moments where I felt like I saw everything almost new than what I saw the day before. Mm -hmm. And I took that same perspective, and I walked into the church mm -hmm. this morning, and I saw Ginny give Ryan a hug from behind, mm -hmm. and I watched Natasha fist bump Yvonne after that wonderful Bible reading this morning mm -hmm. after leading us. Um, I watched, you know, Jim and Judy as they embraced in conversation with Joe and Sarah. And, and I watched Matt and Scott do what they do every single week. But I saw it with new eyes. And I just wonder mm -hmm. what the church might mean to you and what the people in this room might mean to you if we just take a second to have a fresh perspective for a minute. What if, what if we sit somewhere new? I don't want to freak you out. Jim and Judy, you don't have to move. But what if, what if we have a new perspective of the stage or of the platform? Yeah. What, what if we have a new perspective right. of, of the way we come in the building That's right. or the way we, we listen to Pastor Jeff pray? What if we took a new posture, what, what our body's willing to do yeah. or able to do? I just want to challenge you this week and next week and in the weeks to come to have fresh perspective of God's place, of God's presence, of, of this sanctuary. Because it's been really challenging me. So I, I'm going to join in. I'm not, I'm not challenging you without challenging me mm -hmm. too. But could we have fresh perspective as we come into this place in the coming weeks? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Pastor Ben to come up. He's actually going to pray for our offering this morning. And we're going to release our students who are in the room. We have an all-youth uh, service this morning. So students, you're welcome to go. And Pastor Ben, would you please come up and pray for our offering for us? And if you are wanting to give this morning, there are offering plates in the back, or you can give online with the instructions on the screen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the, the many ways that you provide for us, that you care for us, that you provide us uh, health in times of sickness, but you also provide comfort in times of loss. And uh, as much as sometimes it feels frustrating that we might not have everything that we want, uh, I feel like we could truly say that when we put our trust in you, we, we don't need for anything. So Lord, now as we give to you, we pray that you would take uh, our offering, not just of our, our finances, but also our time here this morning in worship to you. We pray that you would bless it, that you would continue to bless us, that you would continue to love us as we love you, uh, so that your kingdom would continue to grow, that others would come to know your goodness and your faithfulness and that we could continue to grow in our understanding of who you are and in our relationship with you and, and with each other. We lift all this up to you in your name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 
scripture this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 12 through 20. I'll be reading a slightly different version. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I won't be mastered by anything. Food's for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but he will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make the members of a harlot? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a harlot is one body with her? For he says that two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Scott Daniels writes, Many years ago, when I first started doing ministry with college-age students, a friend gave me advice on, um, on working with, with students in college. And... Uh, he said to Daniels, if you're going to build a, a ministry with college-age kids, make sure you have lots of free food. And then he said, if you're looking for topics, talk to them about uh, food and about sex and end times and tell them there'll be food and sex at the end times. Um, <laughs> that's a little, little bit off, but if you read the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking about those things. He's talking about food. He's talking about sex. He's talking about the end. And um, I don't know if it helped to grow this troubled group of his or not in Corinth. They were his problem child. Um, but I would suggest today that, it's, that this passage and the larger book of 1 Corinthians are largely about what do we do with our bodies? Because, and Pastor Ben kind of references a couple weeks ago, there's a, there's a heresy, and it's not new. It's been around for a long time. Uh, Gnostics and Gnosticism during the New Testament time and just after was kind of like this. The idea that if I know the right thing, that's what matters. Do I know? But Paul says over and over again, it's not just what you know, it's what you do. Uh, Jesus talks about that, doesn't he? He says, you'll know a tree, how? By its fruit, yeah not just by what the tree knows. I know I'm an apple tree. Great. But you're not producing any apples. I know I'm a fig tree. What does Jesus do at one point to the fig tree that knows it's a fig tree? Maybe it doesn't know it's a fig tree, but it's not producing figs. He curses it, right? So, so there is this connection between who we are, what we know, and what we do, that what needs to come out of my body is, is to reflect the kingdom. And so Paul begins this passage by saying, I can do what I want, but the question maybe isn't what can I do, it's sometimes what should I do. Um, in our culture, there's a word we think about with what I can do, it's freedom. And our culture and our race, our human race, has taken that word freedom and it's twisted it and it's perverted it in a lot of ways. So that we think freedom is the end. Freedom's not the end. Sometimes freedom is freedom. We're not really thinking. We're not, we're not thinking about things can be lawful for me. I can do them. It's possible. But it may not be beneficial. It may not be the good thing to do. G.K. Chesterton once wrote, To have a thing, to have a right to do a thing, is not at all the same as to be right in doing it. So Paul spends time challenging thoughts and sayings of the day. Uh, one of the thoughts of the day was, food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. And he says that may be, but in the end, they're both going to be gone. We spend a lot of time talking about what do I have the right to do. 
What can I do? What am I allowed to do? Uh, do I have to wear a mask? Can I not wear a mask? Can I carry a gun? Can I not carry a gun? Can I have an abortion? Can I not have an abortion? A lot of things are legal, but that doesn't mean it always makes sense to do them. And so Paul is incredibly concerned, not just about your mind or your spirit or your soul. Those are kind of um, philosophical uh, ethereal things. And Paul talks in Corinthians about stuff of the earth, body stuff. 35 times in this short book, he mentions the word or some derivative of the word body. Isn't that interesting? Now, sometimes he uses it metaphorically, like we are the body of Christ. But even then, it's about what we do. He doesn't say we're the spirit of Christ or the heart of Christ or the soul of Christ. He says we're the body. It's how we live things out in the day-to-day -day that matters, too. We have a sense of this connection between um, what's on the inside and what's on the outside. We see when things on the outside start to go awry. The calendar just flipped over a few days ago. What's today, January 17? Okay, 17 days ago, we flipped the calendar over. And a lot of people in a lot of places said, all right, new year, right? going to start do, doing something differently. And 17 days in, you're thinking, please get off of this. I can't believe you're talking about it. I've forgotten about it. I hate it. I wish I'd never promised to do that. I can't ever give up sweets, or I can't walk every day, or I can't whatever it is you're thinking you would do. We know there's a connection between, between what's on the inside and how we carry it out. And, and, that, and that understanding, that connection, may be one of the reasons some of us live with self, such self-doubt or such loathing self-loathing. Let me change this one thing about myself. Let me change this habit. Let me change this, this, this pattern. Let me change this, this relationship. And life would be a little more bearable. It may be one of the reasons some of us hurt ourselves or some of us hate ourselves. If we could just stop the negative, the negative talk, the negative actions. If we could stay away from that influence, it's not just our spirit, our mind, our soul, our brain. It's our bodies. We have a sense of that. It, what we do in the bodies matters. It makes a difference. The story is told of a meeting years ago. The mayor of Chicago, Mayor Daley, and Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Martin Luther King was looking for housing rights for blacks in Chicago. And he was saying, if you don't give them to us, if you don't give us some options here, instead of segregating all the blacks in the poorest, crummiest housing, if we don't have the opportunity to, to be in some other places, we're going to march. And, of course, Mayor Daley didn't want him to march because that was going to be bad for business and bad for revenue and income. And so they had this conversation back and forth. And as they focused on march or don't march, Dr. King made this statement. He said, look, we don't have much money. We don't have much power. What we do have are our bodies. And we can march. And that's all we can do. And if you tell us not to march, you've taken away our bodies. All we have are our bodies. All we have are our bodies. Now, I know that there's spirit and soul. There, there's this connection flying back and forth in our gray matter, the brain and thoughts and ideas, but all of it is housed within our body. I don't know about you, but in my upbringing, I felt like I heard a lot of don't. Don't do this, don't do that with the body. Don't drink, don't smoke, uh, don't do this, don't do that. And by the way, there's a place for that reminded of that again recently. We have a five-year-old and a two-year-old who hang out at our house a lot. Love those little guys, those little tornadoes. And when they come in, occasionally I find myself saying, don't touch that, don't, don't go there, don't climb on that, don't lick your brother, don't, you know, don't do all this stuff. But then I think, is that who I want to be? Is just the don't guy? Is that what life is all about, is all the things we don't do? And so occasionally a, a spirit of creativity hits me and I sit down on the floor and I play with a puzzle or an instrument and the next thing I know, a five-year-old and a two-year-old are interested. Not because I said don't, but because I said do. And the good news of the gospel in part is Paul says do, do this. You're united with Christ. Unite your body with Him. In his book, You Are What You Love, James K.A. Smith says this, your deepest desire is the one manifested by your daily life. Think about that for a minute. Your deepest desire is what's manifested in your daily life. 
Now, I don't know, this could be a chick, chicken or the egg sort of thing. Which comes first? Is it, is it what I do or is it what I love? I don't know which comes first, but I know they're connected. You do something often enough, it becomes important to you. What if I said, take your phone and pass it to the person on your right and, and let them, I'm not actually saying that, but, but what would they find? What are the top four or five sites you go to over and over and over again? Because what's happening is you're, you're gluing yourself, you're connecting yourself to something or someone by where you go. Those patterns, I pray it occasionally, but it's not, it's not um, original with me. We go over that ground again and again, and eventually they become grooves in our lives. Uh, neuroscientists tell us if you want your brain to stay young, you don't just do the same thing over and over again. You do something new and different. Learn an instrument. Pick up a new game. Try a puzzle you haven't tried before. Learn a language you haven't learned before. That's what keeps your brain young. That's what helps you connect new synapses and new neural pathways. We, we marry ourselves to things, habits and patterns, and we go over them again and again and again. And they start to shape us and form us. Put it another way, what do you want yourself to be attached to? You know, like I do, some things, some people, help us to experience joy and peace and life. Think about it. Who comes to your mind when I say, who helps you experience joy? Who helps you experience life? You know those people. When you hang around them, you find yourself quoting them. You can't wait to be with them. You think, that person just gives me energy. But everyone you know is not like that, right? You know other people. A text comes through and you think, I don't, I don't want to open this, right? You see a phone call from so-and-so and you think, I know it's going to be there. Maybe it's complaining. Maybe it's criticism. Maybe it's neediness. Maybe it's self-centeredness. Some things, some people help us experience anxiety and turmoil and suck the life right out of us. Some things, some people help us to be generous and patient and kind. That's the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Some people help us to do that. Other people help us to be selfish, impatient, and unkind. Some websites, some voices cause us to focus on, how does this affect me? What's this going to do to me? What's this going to cost me? Ever heard the phrase, united we stand? 1799, Patrick Henry used the phrase in a speech. Here's the thing. Sometimes it's true. Sometimes united we stand, but sometimes united we fall. It depends on what we unite ourselves with. Right? It depends on who we unite ourselves with. Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful, but I will not be dominated by anything. I don't know if you have a drawer like this in your house, but most of us have a drawer where there are little, um, little tools and little things that don't quite fit everywhere else, often in the kitchen. And uh, many of us have a tube, a little tube in that drawer. It's small. It may be not much bigger than a thumb or a finger. And inside that tube is an adhesive with a fancy name. Super glue is what we call it, right? And I don't know all the science behind it, but I did a little reading this week, and what, what that little tube requires is just a hint of humidity. Not much more water than is in the air right now. And so when you open that tube and you bring it out, that amount of humidity is enough to make that adhesive stick. Bonding doesn't take very long with super glue, does it? I'm not going to ask you the specifics, but anybody have a super glue story? Those would be fun to hear, wouldn't they? Now, they wouldn't have been fun to live through. And when Paul says, don't unite yourself, The word he's using really is cement. Don't cement yourself. Don't don't make yourself stick to just anything. I thought of super glue. 
Because you and I super glue ourselves to stuff all the time. Back to your phone and the five most popular websites you visit, the places that you have shortcuts on your screen to get to because you go there so often. What's happened? You've bonded yourself. You've super glued yourself to things, to people. You can do it, but it may not be beneficial. Let me give you an example. The teens are out of the room today, so I don't know who's in, in the room as you're watching on the screen. But I remember, both as a parent and as a child, um, saying or hearing, you're so glued to that screen. Now, I wasn't literally, you know, but I'd spent a lot of time, more time than my mom wanted me to. Or my kids had spent more time than we wanted them to. And it's interesting because there's fruit. There's a result of spending a lot of time in front of a screen, isn't there? How many of you know, think you know what I'm talking about? How many of you would say, after somebody watches a screen a lot, they are more talkative and generous and willing to socialize than before? Why are you laughing? Because you know. The opposite's true, right? You spend more time in front of a screen, and you don't want to hang out with other people. You're not more generous. You're not more patient. You're irritable. You spend enough time in front of a screen, you think, Get, just leave me alone. I want to listen to this. I want to watch this. All things may be lawful. You might be able to do it, but it's not beneficial. It's not good for you. Why? What happened? You've glued yourself to that medium for a time. It's interesting listening to people like Steve Jobs, one of the founders of Apple, or um, Bill Gates and Microsoft. If anybody would have a reason to want people to have these things in their hands 24-7, it would have been Jobs and Gates. But listening to both of them, they had said in the past that when dinner time came, do you know where the screens were? Not at the table. Set them in a basket before you come. Don't bring the iPad to the table. That's not the place. We come together to look each other face to face and have conversation. Every evening, Jobs made a point of having dinner at the big long table in his kitchen discussing books and history and a variety of things, says one of his biographers. No one ever pulled out an iPad or a com computer. The kids did not seem addicted at all to devices. Paul says, I will not be dominated by anything. I will not let myself get so glued to something else that it has authority over me. And you can become glued to a screen. It's not beneficial. It's not life-giving. You could become cemented to food or someone you aren't married to or to a political party. But that's not the call of Christ, is it? Paul says, do you not know your bodies are members of Christ? You already have a super glue partner. And there's really only room for one. Do you, know, do you not know your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? And Paul thinks everybody should know the answer to that, right? That's a rhetorical question. He wasn't really thinking, they're really not sure about this. Got to teach them about that. No, he knew that they knew. I can't put my body together with somebody else, a prostitute. No, it doesn't make any sense. And so he makes the case. He says, well, don't you know that whoever is united, and you can fill in the blank, he uses sex, but whoever united with Anyone in any of these ways becomes one with them. The scripture says the two shall be one flesh, but anyone who unites to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. What are you super glued to? I don't know how long it takes for the bonding process in other areas of life, but that little tube doesn't take long at all. I wish sometimes it was that obvious to us in other areas. United, glued, cemented together. What have you glued yourself to? A screen? A candidate? A substance? Pornography? The news? Social media? It was interesting last week, um, we were talking about letting go of and not being mastered by things. And several said, I'm going to fast from things. And the most popular things people were going to fast from this past week were social media and, and news and food. What do we use our bodies to connect to? Do they have mastery over us? The good news of the gospel is we can be intentional about who or what we get connected to. I was asking some of my friends this week, um, what was it that, or who was it that you wanted to remember when you got your tattoo? 
put it out on Facebook, and I had about 40 friends respond. And it was fascinating to hear them talk about why they got tattoos and where they put tattoos. I even got a few pictures that I won't show you. Um, but they said things like, my tattoo connects me to a friend or a grandparent or a child. A tattoo helps me remember one who has or had breast cancer to tell her or to remind me, you're not alone. To remind me of my journey with Christ. To remind me I've received grace and mercy and that I am called to give grace and mercy. To remind me of a chapter in my life, a decision I've made somewhere in the past. One person said, I have flowers tattooed on me and they match the flowers from our wedding invitation years ago. Somebody else said, my spouse and I have matching tattoos with our anniversary date on them. The one that stood out to me was this one. She wrote, my sister got a ta tattoo on her hand, and it matches a, tat uh, matches a scar on her son. Her son is a military veteran, and he was close by when a bomb went off. And part of his body has been damaged and now shaped, reshaped forever. And my friend said his mom, my friend's sister, got a tattoo to be in solidarity to remember what her boy had gone through. The tattoo glued these people together to their memory, to their journey. Each person wanted to be connected, cemented in some way. What is it you're glued to? What is your, you've super glued yourself to? What is it you're cemented to? I said this earlier, but I want to expound on it for just a moment. Freedom is a myth. The idea of absolute freedom is not true. Um, John Donne wrote years ago, no person is an island. You, you're not free to just be out there by yourself. And Bob Dylan years ago said, you've got to serve somebody. You're not free just to be free. And if you're looking for scriptural reference, go to Exodus. God doesn't tell Pharaoh, let my people go so they can be free, and then stop there, does he? He says, let my people go so they can be free to worship me. And in our text today, Paul says, don't you know, you've been created to be what kind of a building? A temple. A temple is not free just to do whatever it wants. A temple is to house a deity. In this case, the living God wants to live in you. That's what your body is for. You were created. You didn't choose to exist. You were created to be a house, not a drive through You were created not to be a consumer for Walmart or Amazon or Meyer. You were created not to be taken advantage of, not to be counted on your vote. You were created to be a temple. For the Hebrews, we've said it a lot recently, for the Hebrews, the temple is the place where heaven and earth met in a unique way. Guess what? You're walking, talking, temples to the living God. Really, together, Paul says, in singular, you together are the temple of God. For you were bought with a price. So, really, Paul says, you belong to God twice. You were created, so God owns you because of that. You've got the mark of God, the image of God upon you. Remember, Scripture says, let us make man in our image. But as if that wasn't enough, when we wandered away, God says, I'm going to buy them back. I'm going to bring them back. And so you were bought with a price, and you're now, as the church fathers and mothers would say, twice bought, twice owned by God. I love this thing, and I hate this thing. When it works, when it does what I need it to do, I love it. When I'm in the middle of nowhere, and I don't know how to get somewhere, and I punch in something, and it says, oh, Here's how you get out of here or get there, and I'm able to. I love it. This past week, Tammy and I were out of town for a time and uh, found myself in a hotel room, and I woke up, uh, I don't know, 3, 4, 5 in the morning, whatever time it was. It was early. It was dark. And I go to sleep first, and she goes to sleep second. We don't plan it that way. It just happens again and again and again. So I think by 30 years in, this is probably the way it is going to eventually be. 
So I woke up, and I thought, what time is it? And I looked at my phone, and then I thought, I'm in the middle, middle of uh, another state, and I've got some meetings throughout the day. That's why I was at the hotel. Do I have to charge this thing? So I looked, and it said 78%. I thought, that's, that's not true. That's not true. Because I know when I charged it last. I knew how much I used it. I knew it was not 78%. So I turned it off and turned it back on. And when it came back up, it told me the percentage that was left, the percentage of power, which was 1. So now at 3 or 4 or 5 in the morning, I'm fumbling around trying to find uh, the cord, and then I've got to find the adapter, and now I've got to find a place in the wall to stick it in. It's really good I waited until the middle of the night to do all this, right? And you're trying to do it quietly so you don't wake up the person in the other bed. It's a Ricky and Lucy sort of thing, I guess. We had, we had two, two smaller beds. I don't know. That's TMI for you. If we weren't at home, it would be different anyway. Like, I have to apologize for this. So I plug the thing in, I get the adapter, I get the cord, I get the outlet, and it's not charging. And I've been down to 1%. So now panic starts to set in, right? I'm, a, I'm two states away, I've got meetings throughout the day, I've got to be able to stay in contact with certain people. Well, it finally did work, but I'm thinking that's a sermon illustration. You can be connected, but if you're connected to the wrong thing, you don't get what you want out of it, Right? And so you find yourself doing a check. Is it the adapter? Is it the cord? Is it the port on the phone? Is there a switch somewhere in the middle of the night? I've got to flip in the hotel room to make sure that the outlet's on. What are you connected to? What are you glued to? You may be connected and thinking, why isn't this thing working? Why is this working for me? Because you're connected to the wrong stuff. The good news of the gospel is there's always an opportunity to connect with the only one that really makes sense to be connected to. Thou my best thought by day or by night. It's, he's the only thought worth having. And then everything else flows out of that. My friends got tattooed. Some of us put on rings. We have lots of ways to show we're connected to each other. As Christians, we have a sacrament. We go down in the water. We die to ourselves. We come up out of the water and we say, we are not our own. I don't belong to myself anymore. I'm his. Every thought I think, every word I say, every attitude or action that I display, every habit or pattern that is formed in my life, it is all to point to him because I'm a temple. That's really what I'm here for to house the Spirit of God, to point to Him, to let Him move and let God show who God is, however God chooses to, in me and through me. And if I glue myself to anyone or anything else, that's going to be trouble. And I'll think, why isn't this thing working and connecting the way it's supposed to? Who are you connected to? Who are you super glued to? Let's pray. Would you just respond to what you've been hearing this morning? I have a feeling most of you have been hearing and thinking something. Maybe it's not an audible voice, but you've been thinking something today. Maybe it's, maybe it's condemnation and judgment, and the Spirit's pointing out in your life, you need to stop being so connected to that. Or maybe you need to, you need to just get disconnected completely. It's like being connected to malware. It's, it's going to infect the whole system. You need to unplug from that. If you're sensing that today, would you just say, okay, God, help me. I need to want to, or I need strength. I've tried this before, and I'm so tired of failing. So here I am again. Maybe today you think, I don't, I don't really have anything I'm glued to that I shouldn't be. Would you just say, God, I don't think... I'm glued to anything, but then would you take this bold step and say, but if there's something you want to show me, show me. And maybe it's not today, maybe it's later this week, and we'll be standing there together, and you'll tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, remember Sunday morning, right about 12 or so? And you prayed that prayer, I'm showing you now. There may not be an expiration date on this prayer. Best if this prayer is answered by... 
God doesn't work in our timing, right? So just say, God, you have my permission this week to show me what I'm glued to, what I've cemented myself, where I've, where I've united myself. We know how wrong it is to unite ourselves with certain things. And if I'm doing that and I'm unaware of it, would you please show me? Would you pray that prayer? How would the church change if every Christian around the world said, show me where I'm connected, I'm glued, I'm super glued, I'm united to something or someone I shouldn't be. Man, this place would look different. Would you pray that? That's a bold prayer. And then let's pray for some others. Who's on your mind this morning? Who is, who is at the front of your thoughts? You're thinking, God, they've glued themselves to something that is destructive and damaging and damning. Maybe it's a parent praying for a child. Maybe it's a, a spouse praying for another spouse. Maybe it's, maybe it's you praying for a friend. Would you do a recall? a musical recall from this morning, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Even though I, I could couch that, not fear for me, but fear for them, yeah, but you don't have to be fearful. God, I'm giving this person over to you again today. Show me what it looks like to be the temple of your Holy Spirit without fear in this situation. Would you pray that for someone you love, someone you're carrying a burden for? God, show me what it looks like to be the temple of the Holy Spirit in her life, in his life. And not to be fearful that, that you're not on my time schedule and you're not limited by the things that I'm limited by. The psalmist, and we read it this morning, said, you have searched me. You've searched me and you have known me. You know when I sit. You know when I rise. You discern my thoughts from far away. You know me completely. And just as God knows you, God knows the person for whom you're praying right now. And then let's pray for some other people who've been on our prayer list. We think of the McElrath's brother-in-law, Goldman. For Wendy Wallace, friends of the Coles. For Alan's father, Don. For others who are facing physical battles sickness, or surgery. For those who are facing spiritual battles. For those who are facing financial troubles. In the midst of all of these physical and financial things where the enemy would like to get in and whisper doubt. Really the best response is fear. The best response is anger. Pray that the Spirit would combat that. Remember Jesus' promise, I will build my church. Well, these are moments and places where God wants to build the church in the lives of people you know and love when they are threatened, when they are tempted. So God, we're claiming your promise today. Would you, would you say that? God, we're claiming your promise today. You will build your church. And then name that person. She is one of those people, Lord. We give her to you. We give him to you today. God, we pray for our country. We know that uh, we have been through some tumultuous days and weeks recently, and we know that the next few days have more challenges, and so we just give them to you. We lay them at your feet, reminded that you are the king of kings. You are the president of presidents. You don't have a term limit. You are the leader that other leaders will bow to. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We, we confess that again today, and we ask for the week to come that you would show up in ways only you and your kingdom could show up. Would you pray for the week to come? Would you say, God, I give this to you. Speak what is true. And God, we pray that whether we are watching on the screen, kind of funny, I, I, I bashed screens pretty hard today, but thanks, thanks that they're also able to be used for the kingdom's sake. So thank you for those who are on the screen. Thank you for those who are in the room. And we pray that anybody connected with this people in this group 
would be being formed and shaped as followers. Lord, the world wants to deform us, wants to twist us and shape us, turn us in on ourselves, but we know that it's when we seek you, you make us who it is we were intended to be. So may we all be being formed and shaped to be followers of Jesus. And may the story not stop there. May each of us, within the sound of, of this voice, be participating in helping others to be formed and shaped in the image of Christ, that the gospel would go out, that the good news, that we can be united, we can be cemented, we can be super glued to the God of the universe. You've invited us to do so. May we help other people find a better story than the one they've been living in. We give thanks. We pray the prayer now. You taught your followers to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Join us as we sing a response to the gospel today. Take my life and let it be.
Take myself and I will be ever only all for Thee, ever only all for Thee, ever only all for Thee. What are you glued to? Um, One of my favorite stories in Scripture was one of the Old Testament readings for today. It's the story of Samuel. Remember the story? His mother can't wait to have a child, but a child's not coming. It's not happening. And finally she says, Lord, if you give me a child, I'll give that child back to you. So Samuel is born, and at the right time, he goes to live in the temple. And so he's in his room one night, and the priest is in his room one night, And little Samuel hears the voice, and he runs over, because it's just two people in the temple, he thinks. And he says, Eli, you called me. No, the old man says, I'm tired, go back to bed. So Samuel goes back, but it happens two more times. And finally, Eli, takes a little while to clue in, doesn't it? Finally, he says, ah, okay, next time it happens, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And in that moment, the old man, Eli, who was not as clued in as he should have been, teaches the young person to hear the voice of the Lord and learns what it's like to be glued to God for the rest of his life. What are you glued to? What voice are you listening to? And are you helping other people to hear the voice of the Lord? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord look upon your life and smile and give you peace. And may you help others to experience the presence of God and to learn they can be glued to the presence of God too. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and God's people said, Amen. Go in peace.